Every January, Virtue joins the National Cybersecurity Alliance in celebrating Data Privacy Week. And at Virtue, data privacy is central to our mission. It's core to everything, all the work that we do. Um, and we're living in a really interesting time as it relates to data privacy and security. Um, you see it in the news almost every day. People are increasingly invested in making sure their private information remains under their control. And so I'm excited to dive into this topic today with Virtue's CEO and co-founder, John Ackerley, and our SVP and general counsel, Mishi Chaudhary. Um, so let's start with this idea of respect when it comes to privacy. At Virtue, our motto is respect the people, respect the data. And fittingly, uh, the theme for this year's Data Privacy Week is respect privacy. Um, so John, I'd love to hear your thoughts on you know, this idea of respect and how it is so um, critical to you know, this idea of data protection and protecting privacy. Great, so the great question. And to Megan, thank you for the pulling this together. The, um, you know, for the past, 20 years plus, you know, it's been, so the mission control, we have a respect problem, really respect as defined by the, the mutual regard for the rights and wishes of others. And, we, and when it comes to people's data, uh, for the longest time, third parties often would repurpose, reuse that data for intent outside of that data owner control. And my brother and I founded the company 10 years ago really about how do you, through technology, bring more respect to the technology ecosystem by ensuring that you know, people and institutions that need to share data to get jobs done can, can really do so with the confidence that they're always in control. Because at the end of the day, who are we in this online world, which is ubiquitous? We are our data. And so that's why respect is really at the core of everything we're doing, whether we're selling software to uh, to the Verizon to meet ITAR use cases, or to doctors' offices, or the uh, tens of millions of uh, users who are deploying our free software to really take back control of, over their information, and that's really at the heart of respect. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that you know a lot of the work that Virtue does is is to return that control to the individual who owns the data. Um, which is kind of at the center of, of privacy is, you know, I as an individual have control over my own information. Um, you know, it belongs to me and, and I want to be able yeah, to- Yeah, and it goes, by the way, you know, back to the the uh, Safer Punks, so the manifesto in terms of how you really think it, you know, really how Eric Hughes and that group, you know, really spoke about privacy, not about secrecy, but the power to, to then selectively reveal yourself to the world. And that's when you- apply controls to data in a super easy way, you can actually make that vision a reality. Absolutely. And I think that that, you know, right now in the landscape we're in, it takes shape in different ways in different parts of the world. And, you know, Mishi, I know that you have had a front row seat to that and the work that you've done both in the US and India, um, you know, related to pri data privacy, policy, technology, and the intersection of those things. Um, you know, in different places. And so I'd love to hear from you about that work and kind of what you've observed in terms of, you know, data privacy and, and policy impacting the lives of, of people around the world. Thank you, Megan. And uh, I think in the last 15 years, looking at the tangled web we have woven around the internet, it started to become clear to me that free decision making is impossible in a society where every move is monitored. And privacy is a requirement for not only democratic self government, but also just to have the freedom and the fundamental right to be alone in our thoughts. And what was happening was that a lot of web infrastructure was being built without considering privacy, which was endangering our basic freedoms. And uh, that seemed to be producing a threat to our common human interests on a global scale. Um, India, where, where I was born, a tiny country with only 1.25 billion people, and the United States, um, where I, I have aged, uh, a country with the, a lot of say in how we build products and what we offer, they both actually are in the forefront and in vanguard of what the rest of the humanity will think about data collection, data monetization, and privacy. 
So um, I started using my law license, seeking to protect the fundamental privacy of network interactions. And uh, increasingly, what emerged from that work was that the world is unifying in one key regard, that is, individuals should have total ownership and complete control over their own data. Um, a lot of work with the companies also showed me that we need to build responsible replacement software, uh, providing the existing functions in ways that respect users' privacy to replace the systems that are hazardous to privacy. That's why what we do at Virtue is so important because we understand what users need, what businesses require, and we respect the individuals their requirements, their business, and their data by handing back control to them. And um, simply stated, all of it is about not only respecting the data, but about the individuals who build a society and carefully considering how other people's information and digital assets are treated. So as I see more and more legislations being developed, whether in the United States or in India or the rest of the world, but also a lot of sensitivity in individuals about what happens to that data. That's why being at Virtue every day helps me figure it out that we are offering to the world what it needs. If Virtue didn't exist, we'd have to invent ourselves. And um, it really brings together what people do not realize that uh, sometimes the products are so useful and integrated in our lives that we forget what comes along with it. And we are taking care of that and offering the product without worrying about what the problems are in terms of data collection, et cetera. And uh, that's why, uh, free decision making is impossible in a society where every move is monitored. And uh, that's why we need to discuss more about respect and what it means at a larger scale and not, not only at the product scale. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, your point about our you know, the platforms we use, the things that we use every day, it's so important to take a step back and understand like what what information am I am I kind of trusting and trusting to the platforms that I'm leveraging and and am I protecting that in a way that, you know, safeguards my information and, and gives me control as as the individual. Um, and how that, you know, from a product level all the way up to a policy level, you know, takes shape and can really impact people's lives in a very dramatic way. Um, and yeah, John, I think that you have seen this oh, firsthand as well with your experience in the White House. I'd love to hear like, you know, your thoughts on that based on your experiences as well. Yes. Well, <laughs> so then how much time do you have, Megan? Uh, <laughs> uh, let's go. Uh, no, I mean, just to boil it down and first to just add on to what Mishy said, I think one of the encouraging things too is, you know, when you uh, integrate technology that puts the people first and, you know, kind of leads with that user experience, whether it's invisible in the background, but the individual knows that it's there sort of as a, as a custodian in effect of their data. Um, it also, uh, you know, well, so many companies over the past decades have put the security first or talk about encryption. They talk about the how, but not the why, and they forget about the person that has to interact because at the end of the day, if you get in the way of someone doing their job, they're, they are just going to reject um, that security, uh, which is which, which has been a big problem. Uh, and it's been our focus since that day one. I think one of the encouraging things is companies are starting to, and also governments, which I'll talk about, um, are really starting to appreciate that. We hear about people talking more and more about that user experience around data privacy um, and security tools. And tying it back, not just into, okay, we need to check the box from a compliance perspective, but if we are, are effective custodians of our customers' data, of our partners' data, that increases trust. Yeah, the Boston Consulting Group put out a report that companies that score high on trust and, and, and the digital security component and privacy being a key, com key part of that, uh, they are three times more valuable uh, as measured by a stock price tied directly back into this, you know, into measures of trust. And so it becomes 
a very valuable investment area for them, which is doing the right thing. And this has not always been the case. And I think it's really been over the past few years that we see this coming out. So it's about better decision-making, operational effectiveness, increased trust, and better security. But it's really about thinking about everyone who you're responsible for as you're doing your business and all that digital exhaust that you produce as a company. Um, it, it is super important. You know, it ties back to my time in the White House pre and post September 11th. I was in the West Wing when um, when we had Secret Service come up and and say, uh, "Ladies, take off your high heels," and everyone else just run. I mean, I've never seen Secret Service so concerned. Um, and I was a mid-level staffer, so the really important folks went right down 50 feet underneath the White House, and the rest of uh, the the uh, team went out on Lafayette Square, and that was a really intense period. And I saw two big kind of kind of momentous shifts happening firsthand on the back of that. On the one hand, it was very clear that due to a lack of trust, even between U.S. intelligence agencies and our partners, data was being kept in silos. Dots were not being connected, and so the attacks happened. So there was a real mission impact that happened from a lack of trust and a lack of tools. And this was back in 2001, obviously. This is before Gmail even existed or the cloud was even um, in existence or even the term cybersecurity, the, even the term cybersecurity was sort of just coming into being. So there was a real mission that affected this problem. And then you had the other side of the challenge too, not that um, I saw any nefarious activity, but legal uh, you know, regimes came into place, in particular the Patriot Act, that were very broad-based, that were, you know, law enforcement's request over the past 15 years. And I was in the room as documents basically on day three were brought in 15. That it felt like six feet tall, but you know, it was, you know, it was probably just you know two feet tall. But literally, DOJ came in into the White House, and you know, this was their request list, and, and it was not targeted narrowly to combating terrorism. And so you had a trust issue on the other end that led to Edward Snowden, the surveillance issues, um, legacy. Um, uh, so, the, so, so the regulations like the Electronic Communications Privacy Act that stated that if your email was with a cloud provider after 180 days, that should be publicly available because you shared it with a third party and you effectively didn't care about whether someone else had access to it. Like really tough, bad stuff. And so what you had was sort of the emergence of Internet 2.0, a lot of sort of lack of control over information. And you saw it manifest again and, and again from a data linkage perspective as, as one big cost, another big cost. I mean, even in the COVID response after all this time, people not, not, not wanting to kind of buy into contract tracing applications uh, because they were afraid that data was repurposed. So all kinds of big problems came about. And I think here we are today, 2023, in, in a position where companies, governments are starting to recognize this and there's technology available to start moving the pendulum back, back into balance. So that's a long answer to your question, but that's how my experience impacted why we're true. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's interesting that, you know, over the course of over 20 years, like some of the core problems are still there and perhaps amplified by, you know, how um, widespread our digital lives have become, but now there are more tools than there have ever been to, you know, to rein that in and to return the control to the individual. But we, of course, still have a very long way to go, both here and, you know, around the world as, you know, data sovereignty um, becomes a really important topic, both here in the EU um, and, you know, everywhere around the world. Um, and so, you know, as you're looking at, at the news today and, you know, the, the broader landscape, um, you know, what, what gives you pause and concern? And then what are you seeing that gives you hope um, for the future of privacy? Well, one uh, quick one is it gives me a lot of hope that we were able to encourage Mishi to then join Bertru as a global <laughs> leader on these topics and who's been driving open source, um, you know, policy for, for them a very long time. So with that, Back to Michi, <laughs> and then I've got some thoughts too. Thank you. Um, well, this is a very cool place to work. And uh, uh, <clears throat> if other people want to join the good fight, here we are. But I think um, it, it's important. What gives me concern is a little bit more conversation about increased protectionism 
and insistence of data localization uh, without realizing the fact that uh, collaboration, innovation, cost efficiencies, all the best parts of working digitally are impacted by these de decisions. What encourages me is a demand from consumers that IT should protect humanity and the desire to use these products, which are right now like green technologies or equivalent that so that they can shift to the right ways of using products which make their lives more convenient, which gives them the benefit of what digital offers, while not to worry about how the data is being monetized, if there is sensitive information which is being collected, uh, personally identifiable information, um, health information, financial data, which is categorized differently across different countries. If all of that is used, what people want is the efficiencies that emerge out of it, but they would also like the legal infrastructure, the policy, the regulatory infrastructure, plus the products to be able to do in the background what their expectations are and fulfillment is. And to see for these questions to be in the forefront for people to ask those questions, like John said about contract tracing, why people were worried about the fact because they know that the consequences are sometimes which they can't even wrap their heads around. And that's why they would like and that demand and those discussions when they're in the forefront and policymakers are forced to grapple with them, that encourages me quite a lot. Um, I also think that it is important that the governments are realizing the fact that the trust we are placing in our digital infrastructure, it has to be proportional uh, to how trustworthy and transparent that infrastructure is. And the consequences we will incur if that trust is misplaced, which is why increased demand for open source software, increased demand for legislation, which is simply written and easily executable, not only for the people and the regulators or lawyers like us, but for the businesses also where there's predictability and where encouragement for more products, which actually make the ecosystem more robust that really encourages me because at the end of the day privacy is not so much transactional but it is ecological it's about collaboration if i have data and i can't share it with all of you within the company or outside with our collaborators then there is very little utilization for that data itself and um, that encourages me and if you want uh, other things which keep me up at night i would need a few more hours but I'm not going to waste your time with that. Good answer, by the way. Yeah, no, look, I think very similar. Um, what has been a concern for a long time, I mean, you know, leaving aside the lack of federal privacy legislation, even though there is you know, a good starting point with the California Privacy Rights Act, et cetera, you know, I think you know, one of the concerns around a cottage industry that is the privacy kind of technology industry, you know, in the, in the, in the positive part is I've seen an evolution, but oftentimes there are tools where it's kind of adding to effectively like a longer SOC 2 compliance list, where you just have to check more boxes and sign more legal documents. And it just becomes burdensome, particularly for smaller businesses, and only the largest can actually comply with sort of real sclerosis around just compliance versus how do you use technology to no BS actually provide that fine grain audit and control of data stored internally and importantly shared externally with partners, which is still where over 65% of all data that, that an enterprise is custodian of is actually shared because they have got to like get value out of it. It's just the way things go. Like in the past, there have been no controls over that externally shared data. So, you know, encouraged by that progress, I think a lot of it, and, you know, as a hardcore moderate who has no party anymore, I can just say it, like one of the great things is actually that it's a bipartisan, it's a non-partisan yeah. issue. And, you know, the fact that, you know, I think what is interesting is what the Biden administration has done Really through the through the lens of security yeah. and embracing this architecture 
with a name that uh, you know confuses people, but is a very useful architecture around zero trust. There's a data pillar that actually overlaps with the privacy concepts that actually matter, particularly to the Europeans, and 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 then also you know so then globally, it's how do you actually provide real sovereignty over your data, and that's we tend to control over that. And so um, I think over time, what we'll find is a harmonization on, on this approach. And so you can move beyond you know, GDPR and TREMS2, which, which I think has primarily resulted in fatigue over pop-ups, over accepting cookies, to actually a more thoughtful approach to how do you provide real sovereignty. And when you give companies and people sovereignty over their data, that gets right back to the respect issue. Data sovereignty really is respect, uh, all, all about respect. So I'm definitely on board with where Michi is both concerned and optimistic. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, for the broader team at Virtue, those those concerns are the same. And I think that, um, you know, sovereignty is top of mind for us. And, you know, as both of you look forward to 2023, you know, what's ahead for Virtue, you know, what are you most excited about in terms of the work that we're doing to help to address some of these challenges? Yeah, I mean, I'll, you know, start with it. It's, you know, it's, it's been an incredible journey to date. What we talk about at Virtue is that 2023 is day one as well. It's always day one, but it is day one for us in that we have you know, been very thoughtful on the journey. There have been other approaches where companies try to tackle the whole kit and caboodle in one foul swoop, and they typically fail. And we've been really thoughtful, and this is kudos to the team and my brother, about picking particular workflows that really matter and just getting the user experience spot on and then moving on from there. You know, we tackled email first because it's a source of such great risk and exfiltration. I talked about the ECPA and cloud email systems, and that was the right call. That was a hard problem to solve. It took a, it took a number of years. And, you know, here we are now with a multi-product platform based on an open source project that is getting real traction. And we're moving into more and more specific workflows where we're going to bring that same ease of use around file sharing, around enabling for mm -hmm. the Department of Defense, the secure data fabric um, to better collaborate with, with admission partners, really catalyzed but by what happened in the Ukraine, but also with an eye towards Asia and, and other allies needing to be able to move faster and be more effective. That really goes back to data sovereignty and this intersection of freedom and control, intersection of security and privacy, and just really excited about these super important use cases being brought to life and continuing to show to the world that the opportunity of data-centric privacy and security is not a pipe dream, but it can be deployed at scale. The fact that we have 8,000 customers as, as the baseline for Virtue Day One entering 2023 is incredibly exciting. From two of the top five largest banks to again, so proud of all of the small businesses that then use us as well. And so, yeah, I'm super, super fired up about the coming years. That's awesome. Michi, how about you? Um, I think I feel very excited about uh, being able to go from super nerdy teams to actually thinking about business all the time and how to actually figure out to bring that practicalities to everyday life. I think hard problems are hard and uh, there are just no shortcuts. So if um, John is talking about really bringing these, um, turning virtue into a multi-product company and bringing it to everybody in the way they would require and be able to use our products. Um, there is an entire team uh, led uh, by Will and Dana to talk about real zero trust data protection, defining it, thinking about data protection in particular, classification, tagging, and sub subsequent encryption of data for the means of controlling access to it in really larger scales of where national security is an actual issue. And that is super exciting. I also think 2023 is, uh, is a year where, um, uh, like John said, that this area is where everybody can perhaps agree on, that it is not only crucial for all countries, they all are trying to think about the right way to uh, thread this needle. 
And, um, and that's why as legislations develop, um, I am a lawyer, I won't deny I like those really long documents with the complicated language um, uh, as they develop, but they also are trying to address a larger issue which all of us are thinking. And uh, many a times the conversations about privacy, data monetization collection are hijacked only in terms of social media companies, but there are actual real problems which need to be addressed and cannot be done by conflating various issues together. And uh, what I find exciting is that uh, um, I can work with a very motivated team whose mission never changes. John is still using the first slide from the day virtue was formed. And that is very encouraging because I didn't want to spend years of my life um, not working towards something which I feel excited about. So uh, to bringing, a, to me, the individual's freedom to be left alone in my thoughts, to be ability to read, uh, to be able to do things uh, without a middleman watching over is important. And now um, having spent a lot of time in open source as well as law and policy, uh, ensuring that that happens uh, to coming to a company which is building that product because we can have policy, but if there's no product for people to use, how do we actually bridge that gap? Um, that's why I can get up every day and uh, join all of you to making this happen. And to people like you who are taking our complicated legal jargon perhaps, or the technical one and simplifying it to make sure that other people understand why uh, this is a fantastic product and this is a great time to be working in this industry. Absolutely, I could not agree more. I think that you know the intersection of, of Virtue's work and the important work that's being done um, by this team, you know, our amazing customers who span from, as John mentioned, like big banks to small schools to you know, all kinds of commercial entities, like big telecom companies, just like everything that you could possibly imagine. I think it's a need that everyone has. And it's really encouraging to see that data privacy is, um, you know, getting more attention than I think it has in, in previous years as people start to understand the, the real implications on themselves and their organizations. Um, so really exciting work that's being done by this team. Um, and so as we kind of close out our conversation today, is there anything else that you would like to add or anything, you know, that you would hope people take away after um, Data Privacy Week that they can then, you know, incorporate into their work, into their own lives? Um, anything else that you'd like to share? Oh, we built uh, pro-humanity IT, so buy us and leave your problems to us. Uh, but <laughs> you can both buy us, and we also, you know, it is uh, just a try it for free, use it for free as well. You can go to the Chrome store, download. It's 10 seconds to get set up. Start using it for your personal use cases. I mean, by, my goodness, don't, don't like share a tax document in the clear, but also don't share <laughs> sensitive conversations in the clear. And... You know what? Yeah, definitely. And, and if you work for a company where you're like, man, I'd like to be proud of the steps my company is taking to protect its information, definitely bring us up. Um, would uh, love to have that conversation with you. But overall, um, the respect for data and the conversation, this spawns, um, I, I hope it keeps maturing and moving in the same direction. And we are very happy to be part of all of this. Thanks so much, Megan. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Michi and John. And thank you uh, to our audience for watching. If you want to learn more about Virtue and the work we do, um, install the plugin that John mentioned to protect the information you're sharing via email. Um, you can do that at virtue.com. And happy Data Privacy Week. <laughs>